Hey guys, Jason Seishon here. Welcome back to the channel. So this has been a pretty long in the making. I have finally come around to it, but this is going to be my masterclass on Yasuo Katarina. While this deck is sporting about a 50% win rate on ladder right now, I do think the deck has its own fair share of complexities that do make it a little bit more difficult to pilot. And I'm here to impart my knowledge, my 73% win rate over 70 games kind of knowledge, my 80% into masters win rate kind of knowledge that I think will take your gameplay to the next level and enhance how you look and play this kind of deck. But without further ado, my name is Jason Station, and this is your masterclass. Let's jump into it. All right, so let's talk about the deck list first and why I think the cards in this deck are what they need to be. So of course we have a 3-3 Yasuo and Katarina. Um, this is non-negotiable. I've seen some people cut one Katarina, and I am going to disagree with their very heavily. Three Katarina is absolutely essential because Katarina is really what makes this deck work. Now, of course, she also is a very good uh, card within the archetype of this deck, but I think Katarina does absolutely everything this deck wants you to do and is super, super essential to its overall game plan. So I would never go below three copies of Katarina in this deck. We have Fate Blade Swirler as probably one of the best attacking on odds kind of card. Um, it pairs very well with Katarina being able to scale across the entirety of the game, being able to pressure down your opponent, and just force trades throughout the game. Uh, it being able to scale also allows it to trade up into bigger units down the line. House Spider being the one of your best early game blockers into aggressive decks. And of course, we have a plethora of stun cards such as Arachnoid Sentry as well as Thorn of the Rose. I have liked Thorn of the Rose quite a lot, even into a lot of the decks with a lot of pings. Um, the card itself is just phenomenal, giving yourself a access to a one mana stun um, that you can play on whoever's turn and not care about whether or not they're attacking or not is really, really good in conjunction with Yasuo. Just having access to a potential one mana Mystic Shot is actually pretty good. <laughs> uh, not to mention that you can also just pair it with Flock as a two mana deal four is not bad at all. So I do quite like Thor the Rose, and especially in the matchups where they don't have pings, having five attack by itself and being very difficult to remove outside of combat just makes it very good into blocking into the decks like Kai's, into decks like Bard Alawi, things like that. Uh, having five attack is actually just really, really good at trading up as well. And then for the last unit in the deck, we have two copies of Sign and Thousand Tales, just as a little bit of a late game proactivity play, as well as a little bit of refill. Uh, this deck doesn't really have much draw, uh, in, especially within these colors. The only other draw card we have is Whisper Words, outside of Windswept Hillock, which does tutor out Yasuo's from the deck. But having that additional card draw is very, very crucial in these grindier matchups to find your counter magics, to find your champions, or just to give you the extra bit of boost that you need to close out the game. From spell wise, of course, we have three copies of Ravnus Block, probably the best card in this deck uh, as a spell. Just is so essential in clearing out some of the mid game threats like Aphelios, like Victor, like Bard, like Alawi. Um, and also, just very cheap way to pop spell shields, which can come up in the Kaiser matchups. Steel Tempest has been a very interesting card. It's been a card that I historically have not really appreciated within Yasuo decks because I think that it doesn't really serve much purpose if you don't have a Yasuo on the board. But I've noticed that especially in conjunction with Katarina in this deck, you are, you are very, very mana hungry in how you spend your mana. Sometimes you're replaying Katarina very often, so having that very cheap stun is very, very good in stopping your opponent's attack while still giving yourself the mana to do things that you want on your turn. In addition, this card pairs very, very well with Windswept Hillock because a lot of the times you do want to be playing Windswept Hillock as early as you can. Because it costs 5 mana, it's a very big mana investment and often not taps you under a lot of other tools that you have at the 4 mana point like Concussive Palm and Will of Ionia, especially if you do play Windswept Hillock on turn 5. Having Steel Tempest allows you to both play Steel Tempest as well as Windslip Hillock on the same turn as long as you bank two mana going into it. And it gives you that additional layer of threat to develop your own game plan while also forking your opponent into an open attack or if they want to develop into you. One Nopify, two Denies. Um, I think this is the better ratio right now. 
uh, depending on how the meta shifts, potentially back to two notifies and one deny. But earlier in the season, where there's a lot more uh, Kaiza, I guess there still is a lot of Kaiza right now, notify being very, very good into both Valor and Cataclysm, but deny being better into cards like Vengeance and so forth. It's definitely something you can tinker around with. I might go back here and there, but right now I feel like two deny has been suiting me quite well, so I do like this ratio right now. Two twins um is just more often than not just a very good defensive tool in protecting katarina uh, and of course other key threats and cards during the game i would love to find a room for a third copy of twin but right now this deck is super super tight on cards and so having two twins and one no fight seems to serve a very similar purpose no fine twin being very very similar cards for very similar reasons uh, but again i would love to fit in a third twin if i could and might might is a very interesting one of in this deck. Um, I I do quite like it. I don't think I would touch this card because this card can allow you to race in certain matchups, okay, getting a Fate Blade Twirler Overwhelm at a very late stage in the game um, when you can also pair with Katarina to attack multiple times in the same turn. Or if you're trying to race against another aggro deck and they like play fervor on stack to try to negate your attack while also dealing damage being able to might on top of that is just a very very good way of pushing through damage might on katarina also a very good way to level up katarina through like a glimpse block like a fervor block like any sort of ghost block allows you to get through flip katarina and progress with your game plan Willow Bionia uh, is a very, very good card of right now because of Bard, and to a similar extent, Kaiza. Being able to reset the tentacle is very, very good, and just serves as another 4-mana stun slash recall kind of card. And then lastly, with two copies of Whispered Words and three copies of Windswept Hillock, I think nothing to explain there. Um, but again, the deck is very tight on cards. I think that this list is pretty, pretty close to being very, very good. It's hard to say where I might exchange cards here and there. But right now, the only flex cards I can think of is how many counter magics or counter spells you do want between no fight and deny. But for now, I quite like these ratios and I've been quite liking these ratios for the past week and a half or so, or maybe even two weeks. So the next logical step that we're following is the mulligan. Within this deck, I think there are five very, very important cards that you would most like to see in most different mulligans. Uh, the first being Katarina. I think Katarina is the best card in this deck. I think this card will almost be kept in every single mulligan, and this card does everything and enables so many things within your deck. Um, I can talk about that a little bit later, but for now, Katarina is just a good way to level up Yasuo, is a good way to scale Fate Blade Twirlers. The Blade's Edge serves as good removal tools, and it also synergizes very well with Windswept Hillock. If you can find yourselves leveling Katarina in a game, I can assure you that your win rate will also just go up for that game, uh, assuming that you know, you're not falling too far behind in tempo. Flock is probably the second most important card, uh, maybe tied with Windswept Hillock, but Flock is a very, very powerful card. Um, it's pretty much only, your only source of removal within this deck, outside of Yasuo, which I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on, and outside of the Blades Edge you get from Katarina. Um, but into any sort of actual mid-range threat, Flock is your best way of dealing with it. And because you only have three copies of it i'm very hesitant to kick it especially in matchups where uh, i need to kill like a turn three turn four play so it's just very very good and almost every part of your deck synergizes with it uh, you can draw katarina you can draw a sentry you can draw like the thorn of the rose you can draw concussive palm almost every card in your deck synergizes with flock so you don't have to worry about breaking with flock it's just a very very good card in the matchups you need Windswept Hillock, um, this card is phenomenal, especially when your opponent has the attack token on turn 5. It just serves as an absolute wall against your opponent for developing, um, because you can instantly stun the strongest unit. And if you just hold up 5 mana into your opponent's turns, if they're trying to like, slow roll their development, it becomes very difficult for them to really meaningfully get through. Um, but of course, it also just advances your own game plan and works very well to push down your opponent with Katarina. So having a copy of Windsor Hillock to not only draw your Yasuo down the line, but also give you a very defensive tool is very, very good. 
And of course, we have Yasuo. Yasuo is a little bit more flexible. There are certain matchups where I don't really want to see him the mulligan because he's not very useful until he levels up. But against specifically matchups like Kaiza, I do quite like having him. So this one's a little bit more flexible. Uh, I'm not going to keep him in every mulligan. I think that is probably the biggest mistake that a lot of people choose to make in this matchup. They say Yasuo, they keep Yasuo. And he's just really not that important in a lot of matchups. But in sometimes having that ability to mystic shot early units is actually pretty valuable. So a little bit more of a case by case basis. But there are certain matchups where I'm just going to kick Yasuo from my mulligan. And then finally, we have our two drop slot, either Fae Blade Twirler or the uh, House Spider. Depending on the matchup, if it's aggro, of course, I want to keep the House Spider. If it's like a slower matchup, I want to keep the Fae Blade Twirler. But just having a two drop to ensure that your early game isn't just completely lackluster and that you can have some sort of board state when you do level up Katarina is really, really important. So let's just jump into a couple of Wulligans and I'll talk about the matchups as well as what I kind of expect every card to do in the Mulligan and why I keep or kick them. All right, so let's start with the first Mulligan into Kaiza Sivir. So between, and it, and it doesn't really matter which Kaiza matchup you are playing into. I think the most important thing is whether or not they have attack token on turn five. Now, this is actually good for us because we have Windswept Hillock to answer a Kai's on turn 5. And in most cases, our opponent is pretty much always playing Kaiza on turn 5. So Windswept Hillock is a must keep in this scenario. Even if they have attack on 6, I'd still keep it in case they decide to develop Kai's on turn 6. We need to have a way to stun Kaiza without it being able to be denied. If we look at the rest of hand, we have Flock, Katarina, and Will of Ionia. Um, Will of Ionia is like, okay, uh, Flock is good in these sort of matchups, and Katarina is just really good overall. I think what I would keep here is everything but the Will of Ionia. Uh, the only downside to this is that I don't have a 2-drop, which in this matchup, if you do get tempoed out, it is a little bit dangerous and you can fall behind. But overall, I'm happy to keep both Winsup Hillock and Katarina. Flock is just so, so good into this matchup that I'm probably happy keeping it. And Will of Ionia, I just ditched to try to look for a 2-drop or something like that. And House Spider, which rounds off the perfect mulligan that I can think of in this matchup. All right, let's switch things up. Next, we have a mulligan against a Jace Heimer deck. Now, this matchup is going to be a lot slower, which gives us the opportunity to sort of ditch some of our weaker cards and look for cards that we're specifically looking for. And I think this is a very good exercise to think about, especially in this scenario. Against Kaiza, we need very specific cards to stop their cards at very specific points in time. But in these slower matchups, it's a lot less on us to have to stop our opponent's game plan and more so the other way around. And when we're thinking like that, we just want to think about what cards make our game plan the best. And so we have this hand. I think a lot of people look at House Spider and Yasuo and just like, okay, I have an early unit and then I have a champion and that's pretty solid. And then they will choose to keep those two cards in the mulligan. However, that I think sort of this goes against what a good mulligan is trying to do. And we realize that none of these cards actually advance our own game plan. And then we full mull. And then we find Katarina, which is phenomenal in these slower kinds of matchups because the rally helps us apply a lot of pressure. And then we have a deny, which again is good in this matchup. Because our starting hand was just mediocre, I think in this kind of slower matchup, we have the flexibility and time to look for a much better hand one that includes Katarina, one that includes like Fate Blade Twirler, and one that maybe includes Hillock. Honestly, that's about as complicated as mulligans go for this deck. Uh, sometimes you have a hand that has your champions, sometimes you have a hand that has stuns, and then sometimes you have a hand with some early units and Windswept Hillock. And it just really comes boils down to A, whether or not you need Windswept Hillock, and then B, whether or not you need your early units. Generally speaking, I do mulligan away all my stuns, with the potential exception of Arachnoid Sentry if my opponent's attacking on even or odds, or if I'm attacking on odds and I have a Fate Blade twir Twirler to go with it. Uh, because we just have so many stuns that it's almost redundant to keep any single one of them, and often I can just find a much better card to replace them with. 
most complicated decision probably comes down to whether or not we want to keep Windswept Hillock in our starting hands. And in this matchup against a Draven Sion player, where they have a lot of early game aggression, where they have the uh, Flame Chompers that can just really chow us down, it's really important to have an early game board in order to stave off enough of that damage. And so keeping Windswept Hillock, while I think, you know, it does pretty well in third sort of mid game aggression, if they start playing like the Twin Blade Revenants into Scion, it's very, very good. But it's a little bit too greedy, I think, in the specific matchup to keep. And it's other like burn matchups, I definitely wouldn't keep it either. But in this case, I just keep House Spider. And Thorn Road is okay, um, even though it does have one health. Like, it can't die unless our opponent Mystic shots it. And then the rest of Hander is looking all right now. We have an early game. We have Katarina which is good because it allows us to ping down a board unit, and we have a sentry. Let's just do one more because I think at this spot you have the hang of it. I'm just going to pause this, and I'll let you guys think about what you want to keep. I think this is just a very easy spot, but I'll see what you, where your head is at nonetheless, and then we'll convene in 3, 2, and 1. So I think this is pretty obvious. I would just keep Katarina as well as one Winslow Hillock. They are attacking on odds, which is good because, again, Ash LeBlanc is a pretty slow mid-range deck. And on turn 5, they might play an Ash. They might play like a Trifarian Assessor. They might play a Hearth Guard. And if they play one unit into our Winslow Hillock, we're pretty happy with that. And of course, Katarina is just a very annoying thorn in their, you know, in their game plan. And then we have a pretty good early curve as well. Let's jump into the second part of the video. This is probably going to be the top part where I spend the most time on because I think it is also the most important aspect of this deck in order to master it. And that is surrounding Katarina, when to level her up, how to level her up, and what her game plan looks like after she is leveled up. And in this deck, Katarina is absolutely essential. I'm going to say this again. Katarina, three copies of Katarina. Katarina is one of your best cards in your deck. I would probably always keep her in a mulligan, and she does everything this deck wants from the mid game into the late game. And the reason why Katarina works so well with this deck is because this deck is surrounding on this tempo beatdown kind of game plan. We have Fae Blade Twirler, we have Katarina, and we are able to just apply a lot of pressure to our opponent. We have stuns that can get super aggressive, we have Windswap Hillock with Fiasso to start removing things. And one of the coolest synergies within this deck is when you play Katarina to get that rally, you gain the attack token. So what this does is it actually synergizes with Windswept Hillock. So every time you play Katarina with Windswept Hillock on board, so long as you don't have the attack token, you get to proc Windswept Hillock again, which again gives you another stun, it gives you a rally, and then that further follows your beatdown game plan, where now you're taking a unit out of combat, and then you're rallying and setting up another attack with potentially fate blade twirlers or whatever the rest of your board is getting a free blades edge where you can set up like a flock just to kill another unit it's just so so good at removing your opponent's game plan and so so good at leveling up to your yasuo if you do need it to kind of give you a little bit more late game clearance to clear your opponent's deck into those bar decks into those allowy decks into those kaiza decks anything like that and what is what is really cool about this deck versus any other Katarina deck that sees play right now, like Katarina TF, is we reliably have tools to protect and enable Katarina's level up with Nopify, Twin Discipline, Deny, and even Might. If uh, someone tries to like Ghost Block with a Glimpse or a Vile Piece or a Mystic Shot, whatever it may be, you can put Might on top of Katarina to ensure that she does get that strike through and ensure that she does level up. Because once you level up Katarina, your game becomes so much more smoother. You get those blades edges that you can use to ping down your opponent's board. You get access to the Windswap Hillock, which makes your opponent just very, very uh, much more reluctant to develop into their attack turns. Uh, you get the stacking with Fey Blades, or you get the level up with Yasuo. Uh, it's just so much of what your game plan looks like, and everything goes into it. So I'm going to show you guys a few clips of what this sort of game plan looks like after you have Katarina leveled, and then we'll talk a little bit about when you want to be leveling Katarina and how to ensure it you can do so safely. But let's jump into some clips. Let's start with the first example. This is pretty straightforward. We're already in what I would call a very winning position. We have a Katarina leveled up and we're just gaining the attack token at our round start. And this is really nice because we get to make some very 
uh, proactive plays by just simply attacking without spending any mana, forcing our opponent to react. And then we still have Katarina to follow up on our attacks. So it's not like we don't, even though we are making this open attack, it's not like that's going to ruin the rest of the turn. It's not like that's going to freely let our opponent do whatever he wants. And because we have both the Katarina Rally, as well as a Windswept Hillock and Leveled Yasuo on board, every single time we play Katarina, we get to stun and kill one of our opponent's units because there's really nothing much in their deck that has more than 5 health. And we also get a Blade's Edge, which can ping down some annoying sort of chump blockers. He runs Arena Bookie for some reason, don't know. Oh, he got it off of the, uh, the card, so that's fine. Um, and then we have the option to attack again. We can develop or we can swing and then uh, play Katarina again. It's just so flexible in what you can do at this spot that it also just forces your opponent into weird spots. If they pass again here, we could just simply just pass back and just make their development very difficult. But you see in this spot, once you have this Katarina leveled, once you have Yasuo on board, it just becomes a very, very heavy hitter. And these blades I just do stack up, uh, you know, as we chip away at our opponent's health. Uh, these blade edges can finish the game by itself as well. And you're going to see this game plan be pretty consistent throughout your experience with Yasuo. Now in this spot, we don't really have a Windswept Hillock, so the power level of playing Katarina is a little bit lower, but Katarina just gives us so much pressure by herself, forcing that rally. This is a matchup against AJ's Heimer deck, where they have removal spells. And what's really cool about this sort of side is we actually get a pass here because it's kind of on our opponent to do things. They need to develop threats of their own if they want to win the game. Otherwise, I just got to keep swinging with Yasuo for four. They're forced to react. And then I can rally after the fact afterwards, which is just puts them in a really awkward fork. If they play a champion here and then they tap under mana, I can just slam Katarina. I can go Blades Edge Flock and then I can attack. And so this blocks our opponent in a very awkward spot where he really needs to play Heimer. But the moment he plays Heimer, he taps under any sort of removal options and then he loses the game as well. And it's just a really, really awkward spot for opponent. In these matchups, you can just play a lot slower and then force your opponent to react because you always have that threat of rallies. And this last clip is, again, reiterating the same thing that Katarina always does. But this is a little bit more in the mid game where now you're maybe only playing one Katarina a turn at most. And you can just still see how much pressure that you're applying. And in this sort of matchup where you're really trying to race down the Thralls player before they can set up their Thralls, you see that they have two Thralls down at three. This Katarina just really comes into hand in being able to just apply so much pressure. Yasuo in this spot, you know, is just a 4-4 quick attack, which applies his own amount of pressure as well. And you can just like kind of jam in here. And you'll notice that this sort of game plan is just... From the start, once you can get that Katarina leveled up, if you do have a Fate Blade Twirler, no matter what sort of early game turn you are, maybe even like turns 4 and 5, you can always decide to flip the switch and apply more pressure. Now, of course, ideally you do have a little bit of a board state to back up Katarina. If, if, you, if say, I didn't have either Yasuo or the Fate Blade Twirler on board, uh, then replaying Katarina over and over again isn't very a good use of my mana. And that can uh, be very crucial in deciding when to play Katarina versus when to develop the rest of your board state in order to have better rallies is very, very important for this deck. But in this spot, I have a pretty decent board state and I don't mind just slamming down Katarina in order to keep pressuring my opponent. In this spot, I could twin here just to save my Katarina, but I also have a second Katarina in hand. I can use the rest of my mana to develop House Spider if I want to, and then I can open attack, play Katarina, and then just keep applying the pressure. My opponent's going down pretty low, so I think I have this pretty much in the bag. But Katarina, again, just being able to pressure down your opponent so dip much, it really proves why uh, having Katarina in the mulligan can be so powerful against these slower kind of matchups where we have the time to set up our board state and pressure them out with open attacks and then set up for rallies after the fact. All right, so let's go back to the second aspect of Katarina, and that is knowing when to level her, because this is a very easy mistake to do. Katarina always isn't going, always going to be your turn three play, and it isn't always going to be the right choice to actually attack, swing, and level Katarina, even if you have the option to do so safely. Because we need to make sure that we don't fall behind in tempo. This is very, very important and crucial step, because if we play Katarina, level her up, and then our opponent just gets a swing in at us with their entire 
board if they developed um we're going to be taking too much damage with the deck that has no healing our life is a very important resource and it's not like katarina by herself can just come uh, just catch up the game uh, by herself. You need to have a board state in order to make advantage of Katarina, and so you need a board state as well when you try to level up Katarina. Uh, so ideally, you have something like a House Spider, or if you are attacking with Beyblade, Solar Plus Katarina on turn three, at least you're applying a lot of pressure to the opponent. Whereas if they do try to race you, you also do have that strategy with Katarina plus Fate Blade Twirler. Now, of course, against slower matchups, this is a lot less important, and it's just more important to focus on leveling Katarina. Wherever you do have a safe moment to actually level up Katarina, I would take that. Um, but something that's also very, very important to note, it's going to be a lot more niche, but something that can save you if you do think yourself that you're falling behind on tempo if you do level up Katarina, is you can also level Katarina on a block. Because Katarina only reads if she's struck once, which means that if she survives the strike, she does recall and level up. So because we have Twin Discipline in our deck, we can actually give Katarina 3 health on a block to trade down one of our opponent's units and then force our Katarina to level. What's also really, really niche is if we have our Katarina on board, we actually get access to our champion spell which is Death Lotus, being able to deal one to all battling enemies, is a fantastic way to catch our opponents off guard and clear a wide board, the kind of boards that we're very afraid of in falling behind on tempo. So if you just play Katarina on turn 3, don't attack with her and set up a Death Lotus against a very wide board of one health units, that can be a very advantageous way of getting back into the game, as well as potentially leveling up your Katarina by blocking like a 1-1 one -one if they decide to go wide and swing in with it. So uh, just make sure that in the scenario, in the matchup, when you do level up Katarina and in every game, you will try your best to do so. Uh, just make sure that if you do level Katarina, you have some backup plan, you have stuns available, you have a little bit of a board to block down, and you don't fall behind on tempo by too much. So I'll show you some examples of game states where I do level Katarina, and I'll talk through them one by one. Okay, so let's take a look at the first example. This is still back in the game against Sir Termins when he is playing the Scion deck. While we can play Katarina this turn, and you know we can use a Blaze Edge to ping down like his Boon Baboon, we do have the Twin Discipline in hand, and so if we have the mana up to play Katarina as well as Twin Discipline, we're very likely to be able to level up Katarina. And in this spot, even though we did have a House Fighter on board, so I think we're fine if we were able to level up Katarina, um, I would have to pass first and then he will like play a card. I didn't want him to like hold up Mystic Shot mana, where he could kill my Katarina while I had the actual tools to protect her. And in this spot, it's still better just to develop a little bit of board. I was able to develop the Thorn of the Rose, and then this sets me up for a Katarina level up on turn 5, which is a lot better because then we do have Twin Disciplines to protect her. And that going forward is just going to give us plays uh, to have in the future and as well as give us extra Blades Edges to ping down some of uh, these Draven Scion players' annoying board state. And so just realizing that, you know, you're not jamming Katarina every time you can. If you have the ability to play around the removal cards, especially when you have the cards in your hands, I would take the time to do so. Because now we can set up a Katarina, we have the mana to play Twin Discipline, and if our opponent spends, you know, two burn spells into our Katarina, I think that's also sort of a dub in my book for us. But now you see that in this game say we are able to level up the Katarina, and now we have, you know, it's a little bit later into the game. If we did level up Katarina earlier, it's not like she would have had a very big effect on the game state either. We don't have a Fey Blade Twill on board, and we don't have this Windswap Hillock set up either. And so even if we were able to level up Katarina on turn 3, uh, it just wasn't as meaningful, and it probably would have been better just to develop a little bit more of your board. But as you can see here, this Katarina levels up, and then all of a sudden we do have a Windswept Hillock with Katarina, and that's going to set up a very strong laking scenario for us, even if we don't have Yasuo. Again, we find ourselves in a very similar spot. It's turn 3, my opponent has 6 mana up, they're a Mystic Shot 
a vengeance sort of deck but we get to take the pass and then our opponent actually decides to spend all their mana on playing the production surge which gives us a very free turn to not only play katarina but make use of our blades edge removing the 4-1 turret and i feel pretty comfortable attacking in this scenario because you know my opponent doesn't really have much of a board state if they want to develop next turn i can develop myself and maybe i like play palm to slow things down and so in this game board state against this slower control deck i'm not as afraid of going behind on tempo and as you can see here his board state isn't even all that impressive all right i think this game is a very interesting game because right now we just don't really have a play in our hands and we're sort of just playing katarina to gain get advantage of the blade's edge and try to kill this tentacle um, at this point we're also just hoping he doesn't have any sort of removal into our katarina if he has like riptide sermon or like a tentacle smash that's really going to suck from our current game state. And so it's kind of just praying that he doesn't have it. So he doesn't use it now, which is nice. He gets to cash in the Blade's Edge onto the Tentacle and sort of try to slow get down the game a little bit from here. And now the main thing comes up is, do we try to level up Katarina here? Because uh, just spoil alert against a Bard Alawi deck, if you attack with Katarina, um, pretty much you are, you're guaranteed to get a flip because they don't really have any fast speed interaction. But we have to also think about, is it fine to level Katarina here and take like a little bit of a tempo loss? And I think it, the, val the, the advantage that we gain from leveling Katarina, even though we are in a rather precarious board state, is going to give us a little bit of legs down the line. We do have a Fate Blade Tool that is able to kind of uh be able to start blocking bigger units in this kind of matchup Katarina is not really going to get a value trade we don't need to have a twin discipline and so if we want if we just use Katarina as a blocker down the line i'd rather just push the level up here and then if we draw win some hillock down the line at least now we have an active way to win the game so even though Katarina leveling up here is definitely a pretty big sizable tempo loss i'm thinking about future turns about how i'm actually going to turn this game around and win from a what i would call a behind board state so we do find the wins of hillock and now we're setting up for a late game where we actually have a way to come back all right so this is going to be the last example and this is going to be an example of where it's correct to not attack with Kateri. And we see that our opponent has a pretty sizable board advantage you know he's coming in for six on turn three we don't have any house spiders to kind of stem that aggression and so we're just going to play Katarina. We do get a Blade's Edge, which is a nice compensation as a way to remove this 3-1. But we can't really do much else besides that. So they use a Get Excited onto our Katarina here. And we're pretty opted to hit the Nope fight on the Katarina. Now, you can say that's not very important to protect this Katarina, but we're kind of in a spot where if we top deck a second Katarina, we're like, you know, stonks, right? <laughs> we get to clear their entire board if they choose to attack, which is, you know, very, very powerful. In this spot, we're just sort of hedging our bets on our top deck. We have two Katarinas on our deck. If we're able to top deck a Katarina, their attack just suddenly fizzles on the spot. And also, if you look at this board state, uh, they can't really drag Katarina with the Flame Choppers, and they can't really attack with a 1 1 either because their deck doesn't really play any sort of board buffs. And so, by having Katarina on board, we can slow them down a little bit because they can't really attack with any of their 1 1s or even like their 0 2s, um, or at least they can't drag specifically Katarina, which might, you know, reduce their attacks by 1 or two damage and over the long run that can actually mean a lot and then we can sort of stabilize the board from that spot all right so now, now let's transition a more into the stun focus game plan of the deck and let's start with windswept hillock which is probably one of the core foundations of this deck outside of having katarina and let's talk about some of the common mistakes that people do using this card and the first very very important aspect of this card is to always try to play it on a defensive turn and the reason why we want to do this is because we get to maximize how much value we get out of the windswept hillock if we play it on our opponent's turn yes we get the stun which means that we get to slow down their attack and we get to draw into a Steel Tempest, assuming we have a Yasuo on board. If we don't have a Yasuo on board, you can sort of just ignore that part. But what's also really key about this is that when our opponent's turn ends and it goes to our attack turn, we immediately get a second stun on top of the Windswept Hillock. 
and, and even if this isn't like necessarily winning us the game, it's not forcing lethal through, this is going to count for two pro level up progresses for our Yasuo. And whereas if we played it on our own attack turn, um, and then our opponent's turn comes, we don't get a proc. And then finally onto our turn, we get a second proc. You see that it takes one extra turn in order to get the same two procs from the card. And this can matter because leveling up Yasuo can be a very, very powerful win condition against some board specific decks like Alawi, like Kaiza. It can be very, very important to turbo up that Yasuo in order to get him through. And that's specifically why I play Sign in this deck because we do have something to itch our sort of late mid game, late game bomb. We have a proactive six drop we can play that we're not resorted into playing Windswept Hillock as our only play. Because not only do we reveal that we use our Windswept Hillock, and if we don't have a second Windswept Hillock, our opponent is going to be a lot more comfortable developing into their attack turn. And what's also very critical about specifically Windswept Hillock is its stun is a burst speed stun. It's not interactable. When you play Windswept Hillock onto the board, boom, all of a sudden, the strongest enemy is stunned. And this can be very, very important, specifically against a deck like Kaiza, where they do have Ride Negation. If you try to Palm Kaiza and then they Ride Negation and you don't have a way to counter that, all of a sudden, they still get to do their entire turn. And so it's very, very important to have Windswept Hillock up if you know your opponent is going to be developing a big bomb on their attack turn, like Scion on turn 7, Kai's on turn 5, things like that. And of course, if we do have a Yasuo on board, we get to essentially draw a second Yasuo, which turns into a Steel Tempest. And of course, if we are able to play Windswept Hillock on a defensive turn, we're also going to give ourselves access to an additional copy of Steel Tempest, which can only be played when our opponent is attacking. And so we get double the stuns if we do play it on our defensive turn, which a lot very, very makes it very, very difficult to sort of uh, play around essentially from our opponent. It's very difficult to develop because if they develop, all of a sudden they're getting two stuns out. But if they open attack, then they might risk like a poor open attack and then can still play Windswept Hillock after their attack. I think the biggest part of this card is that you're not necessarily trying to use it to get like some big payoff value immediately. You just need those two stuns to level up Yasuo faster. And let's say our opponent open attacks, and then you know we just block down or maybe check out one stun. We still just play Winsome Hillock, get that stun, and then get that second stun for our Yasuo and draw a card. It's much better to play this on our defensive turn, and if we need to play on our offensive turn, we can play as sign in instead. Now, of course, that's not all a be-all, end-all scenario. If we do have the ability to play a Windswept Hillock on our attack turn in order to, like, snipe, like, a back row unit of theirs, like a Nazir, like, just, you know, being able to deal 2 damage if our Yasuo isn't leveled, or 5 damage if our Yasuo is leveled, to a back row unit that, you know, would have been uh, well, not vulnerable if we waited to the next turn, or if they just developed any other bigger unit, and all of a sudden we couldn't target that weakest unit, then, you know, Windswept Hillock can sneak through as a burst speed removal card if we do have a Yasuo on board. So, of course, this always isn't a be-all, end-all scenario, but 90% of the time, you do want to be playing Windswept Hillock on your defensive turns. All right, so the final most pinnacle part of this deck is utilizing your stuns very aggressively. So this is, again, I'm going to reiterate, this is a very tempo-heavy beatdown game plan, and you're trying to beat down your opponent before they beat you down. And often not even against some burn decks, you can race them down using the same strategies. And that is using stuns aggressively. And how you want to be doing this is you want to be developing and baiting your opponent into developing back while holding up stuns in order to set up very big swings. Against a lot of decks right now that are completely board based, like Kai's, the Bard Alawi, things like that, where they don't have cards like Mystic Shot or Single Combat, if you're holding up these stuns, it makes their developments as blocks very, very awkward into you. And so, because our stuns are usually more uh, efficient, something like Concussive Palm allows us to use spell mana in order to use as a stun. We have Arachnoid Sentry, which as a three mana card, not only develops a 3-2 body, but also stuns another unit. And then of course we have access to Guile with Thorn the Rose, being a one mana stun is so, so efficient at helping us push damage through. Because we also have Fae Blade Twirler, that's going to continue to scale and then just pose another unit that our opponent is forced to block. 
I think another very, very key aspect of this idea is to not be afraid to pass on our attack turns. We don't, we aren't satisfied with swinging in for two, four damage. No, no, no. We want to pass, and if our opponent wants to develop, we then get to stun, and then we get to develop a wider board. And I'll show you guys some really cool examples of that because I think it's a very, very fantastic situation and how to maximize your utility with this deck. Now, the second aspect of this is with leveled Katarina. And this sort of just flips the game on its head because now all of a sudden it's not about maximizing your damage in one attack swing that you normally would have to because you don't have any rallies. Now you can be a lot more reactive. You can just set up an open attack and, you know, maybe you're dealing five, six, seven damage. But that's fine because if your opponent develops after the fact, you can then slam Katarina. And if your opponent doesn't develop, you always have that threat of the rally, which is why, again, Katarina is so phenomenally perfect in this sort of game plan. It just fits into this stun archetype so, so well. And of course, if we have a Windsock Hillock on board, that's going to give you a free stun with a Katarina, allowing you to conserve your mana even further. Maybe you just want to save up your counter spells. Maybe you can spend mana developing even bigger threats or just continue to play Katarina in twice a turn. And it just acts as a stun. You get to rally, you get to force on your opponent, and then you get Blade Edges, which is just a very, very strong. So I'm going to show you guys some clips and I'll talk about how we can maximize our effectiveness by utilizing our stuns in a very, very aggressive manner manner in order to push damage through. Let's start small and let's start very easy. Now this turn is very very obvious. We have a Concussive Palm in hand and we have a House Fighter we can easily develop. By developing the House Fighter we always hold up 4 mana for Concussive Palm. Now of course I think it, it should be very clear that an open attack is never good. We're only pushing 2 damage here and we have a very very good hand in order to pressure our opponent. So we first develop initially with the House Fighter holding up Concussive Palm, and now our opponent spends all their mana playing one unit, which is exactly the sort of strategy that this deck preys on, because now we use that stun, and all of a sudden we're representing, what, uh, 10 damage on a turn five swing. And that's all because we decided to develop into our turn because we had that stun available. And taking that open attack was just not enough damage, whereas now we're very ahead on tempo. We were able to chip away at our opponent's life total, which makes it very difficult for their job in the future. And we can always just set up these turns again and again as the game goes on. This is probably one of my favorite play patterns of this deck. This is having attack token on odds, playing Fade Blade Twirler on turn 2 and then open passing on turn three. This is what I mean about not being, able to, not being afraid of passing because our opponent right now has no thralls. They want to play Lissandra if they have it to give, your, to give them a thrall. And the moment they play Lissandra, we get to stun it. And then we're pushing for six. If we take an open attack, we're pushing for one. We don't want to do that. If they pass back, they don't get to play Lissandra this turn, and that slows down their Thrall game plan by one more turn. So it's very, very critical to look for moments like this, where passing can be very advantageous for us, because not only does it slow down our opponent's game plan, if they decide to pass back, if they do develop, they sort of fall into our trap, because we could also just have Flock here as well, right, to kill Lissandra. And now we're pushing for six damage, and we pretty much are in the same spot if we had open attacked, but of course if we open attacked, we would have only pushed one damage. And now I'm going to show you guys a position where we have a Katarina that is leveled in hand, as well as a Windswept Hillock. And now in this position, it makes a little bit, while you still can develop, you know, I can go Fade Blade Twirler if my opponent plays a unit, I can Guile it, and then maybe that sets up for a better attack. But in this spot, you, you can play as proactively as you want to. Like, I can make that open attack because I know I am always in a spot where I always can play uh, Katarina and have another attack. And in that case, I can play as reactive as I want, see what my opponent wants to do. Now that I know he played, spent most of his mana on an Alawi, I can go in and choose how I want to develop my turn. Also gives you a little bit more flexibility in case you aren't able to close all the games and choose to pivot into playing Yasuo instead. Now you can set up a Yasuo and maybe remove some of your opponent's units on the next attack turn with some stuns. And then maybe you can develop Katarina on a falling turn, having Yasuo on board and just making advantage of the stuns with Wind Sub Hillock. In this spot, because I have a leveled Yasuo or Katarina, I was pretty happy to take a free 5 damage on an open attack. Maybe my opponent want to play Make It Rain, and then I can evaluate on how to respond next. 
But in this spot, because you have leveled Katarina, you can just play a lot more flexible in how you want to spend your mana. And that makes your opponent the one who has to react first, which of course in Legend of Terra is a very, very powerful tool. All right, let's talk a little bit more advanced board states here. Um, so this is a pretty peculiar hand. We have a double fade blade twirler and we have a couple stuns. Um, we could use the stun defensively there to save like say save three health. But I think this pan puts us in a very unique spot in a third Fate Blade Swirler now. So now we could say like Arachnoid Sentry aggressively. But I think this hand puts us in a very specific spot where our opponent's deck has no removal and is unable to sort of stop the scaling of our uh, Fate Blade Swirlers. So we can make advantage of the fact by holding on to our stuns. And so until we have all of our Fate Blade Swirlers on board, in order to maximize the value that we get out of our stuns, because the longer we hold onto these stuns, the more buffs we get. And of course, we're going to maybe cash in a stun, maybe on this turn to push like three damage or so, but the value isn't really quite there. So this is just realizing that we can play our hand a little bit slower in order to set ourselves up for a better position, and then cash in our stuns when we have all our Fae Blade Twillers on board. In this spot, I'm debating on the Steel Tempest. Because this can only be played defensively, I do want to start buffing up my Fate Blade Twirlers. So I'm just going to chuck it out here for 3 health. Um, and maybe it's fine. Maybe I want to hold it on for a bit, little bit later when it gets a little bit more value. But I wouldn't mind playing it here just to start scaling my Fate Blade Twirlers. Because right now it's a little bit awkward for them to attack. But otherwise, just realizing that utilizing your stuns aggressively also has a little bit of this setup plan to it. Because regardless of whether or not you're setting up your stuns aggressively, you still kind of need a board to cash in on that damage. And this is sort of a very good example of doing exactly that. And now you notice on my next attack turn, I have the six mana up. I can start getting aggressive. I check out a stun here, see what's up. And... This, what's actually really cool in this spot as well is that now every single stun that I'm playing all of a sudden becomes a much larger threat to my opponent because it's not just scaling one or it's Fae Blade Tours, it's not just scaling two Fae Blade Tours. All three Fae Blade Tours are on board and are getting scaled and all of a sudden this is going to be applying a lot more pressure onto our opponent. So just again, another very good showcase of how I can set up my stuns, maybe take a little bit more damage early on, but understanding the matchup, there's no burns, there's no rallies, and there's no interaction tools. So Fate Blade Toilers are free to scale indefinitely, and I get to force out a deny here, which is fantastic. All right, so as far as information overload um, in how exactly you want to piece the decks together, uh, this is going to be the summary of that. I'm going to have two games from start to end where I will commentate through my turns and why I think it made for a good Yasuo Katarina gameplay game. So I'll leave you guys with two games. Um, to you, Feel free to use them as reference to play through in your head. Think about all the fundamentals that we learned today and try to apply them into the games I'm going to showcase for you guys. Look for the spots where I play Winslow Hillock. Look for the spots I level up Katarina. And look for the spots I'm playing to my win conditions, trying to, trying to find spots where I can turn the game around and apply pressure. And looking where I spend my resources, where I use my stuns, when I use my stuns offensively, when I use them aggressively, and so forth. Now, I know there's a lot of material that was covered today. There even might be some material that I didn't really necessarily get to cover, like sort of Yasuo as sort of a win condition. Although I think that's a lot more fluid. That's a lot more show and feel where that really is. But in terms of information, I'm not going to try to give you guys too, too much. And from a very basic high level overview, I think everything that I've taught you guys in this video is going to provide you guys with a very strong foundation. Now, if you are a premium Mastering Runeterra member, I will also link my Yasuo Katarina guide that I wrote for them, which might come in a little bit more detail. Um, so if you guys are able to access the article, I would recommend you check it out. But for now, I'm going to leave you guys with these two games, and we'll talk afterwards. For the first game, we're going to have a matchup against Bard Alawi. I think this matchup on paper is probably close to a 45%. Um, so like slightly unfavored, it's so maybe about a 55%, somewhere in between, depending on the draws and depending on how many early chimes they are able to hit. 
Uh, generally speaking, this is sort of an interesting mulligan. I think Fey Blade Twirler overall is a very good card, but them having access to like a hired gun on turn two is a pretty good counter against our Fey Blade Twirler because if we don't get the stun early on, um, you know, they are able to kill it and value trade it, which is really bad for us. But overall, I kept a Will of Ionia because in this matchup, I do think this is particularly the matchup I do have Will of Ionia in the deck for, and that's to uh, reset their tentacle. So if you recall like a 6-6 six, six tentacle, for example, uh, it turns into a 1-1, one, one, which is pretty good at slowing them down, but overall just a very niche card and maybe a little bit slow overall. A little bit iffy on whether or not to keep, but this is our hand state so far. And right now, you, you'd notice right now, right away, if they have a hired gun, this ma makes it Fey Blades are a lot more awkward, especially because they hit a chime on the hired gun. And so now we have a little bit of a dilemma. So I don't think we can allow them to value trade into our Fey Blades roller. That's just too negative tempo for us. It just completely puts them ahead on board, and we have to sort of fight for this. So I'm pretty happy stunning the hired gun. But unfortunately, do have a one drop, which allows them to clean down the board. And I think you'll notice here, we're already very behind on tempo. And this is exactly why this sort of matchup isn't really all that easy. Because once you're behind in tempo like this, it becomes hard to play around cards like Tentacle Smash. And so I'm like, if I play Katarina here, I'm not trying to level her because then I'd fall more behind on tempo, which makes my best play just another Fey Blade Thrower. They have another Esmus. And you can just notice on board that their stat lines are just kind of overwhelming us right now. We don't have fantastic blocks, and we're trying our best to get out of this sort of messy situation. Block is a fantastic card against this matchup, um, and other any sort of like mid-range deck in particular, because their deck doesn't have any protection tools outside of specifically having a level of bard on board and then drawing into chimes at burst slash fast speed. And so now I'm just trying my best to dig myself out of this hole. Um, I take a block on the tentacle. Not only does it, you know, reduce the most amount of damage that I can get through, but with this Katarina in hand, I get to set up a kill on this tentacle with the blade's edge. Even if they do decide to protect the tentacle with like an Eye of Nagakaboros, it's always damaged so I can set up for block into the future. Uh, now, of course, even though I can't really do much with the Katarina here, I have nothing better to do with my turn. So I'm just going to spend the mana to play it. At this point, I'm sort of just praying that they don't have a way of dealing with my Katarina. And luckily, they decided to play Bard. I think they did have a way to kill it, but I think they got a little bit greedy and decided not to take it. Or maybe they just thought I wouldn't try to level Katarina here. But in this spot, we're so far behind that Katarina's A, not getting a value trade. So that's going to put us even further behind in tempo if we decide to make a trade that's not beneficial for us later in the line. And having level up Katarina might give us some leeway in back into the game if we draw something like a Windswept Hillock, or if we continue to find other cards like Flock in order to pair with the Free Blades Edge. But our opponent just continues to develop pressure here, and we have a pretty nice turn just to play Sign In, perfect six man development. If we play like the uh, House Spider and we play like Will of Ionia, that's not particularly good. And so sign in here just seems okay. They only have two like actual units we or three units we can or need to block. And it's not like we could block the elusives anyway. So the play here, I'm just gonna play sign in. And right now I'm just trying to look at how I can start to swing things back. And that's a perfect draw for us. We hit the windswap hillock, which now, if they want to develop into their next turn, it's a very, very powerful way of shutting them down. And now we have windswap hillock plus Katarina, which if we didn't try to go for the Katarina level up, we wouldn't even be in this position. And I think my opponent is in the right sort of mind state where, you know, they can't really uh, develop because I then get to play Arachnoid Center. I get to play windswap hillock. And that's what this deck really aims to do. Now, of course, in their deck, they also do have access to rallies, which is definitely annoying and can be something that uh, they can do given this open attack, and that's something I want to be cognizant about. And so I want to play around rally. That is my entire goal of this spot. And so I'm going to stun the bard if... Uh, a unit is stunned, they can't get to attack again on the rally, which is also another fantastic uh, strength to having these sort of stuns. 
I don't block the tentacle because even if I do take the stun, they're gonna have I have not come Boros. I can always just like flock it down the line, but they still have this four or five. And now the reason why I do this is because I can effectively just shut down their rally. Um, I play Fate Blade Twirler to set up a Windslip Hillock if they do decide to rally, and then I have Flock to shut down the 4-2 as well. So uh, just knowing very well of what my opponent is trying to do, and now this is where I can start trying to swing things around. They took a, what I would call a not very good attack because they were afraid of me having stuns, and now that they want to try to rally on me, half their board is going to be stunned, and they now they only have the Esmuses to sort of just try attack through. And because of this sort of setup, deciding to block a unit to flock it, stunning the bard, and then allowing myself to take five damage from the tentacle, not only have I shut down their rally, but I've also set up a rather large board state of my own, having two Fae Blade Twirlers kind of ready to just attack at my opponent is very, very powerful. And they have a third Esmus. We're taking four, which is a little bit scary because the deck does have a little bit of burn and also means that we just can't take any more damage in the future. But now here's where we turn things around. We get a free stun off of the Windswept Hillock onto the Bard, which is fantastic because that was the biggest blocker anyways. And now I'm in a sort of an interesting slot. I could play Sentry to get more aggressive, but Sentry sort of taps me out in an awkward spot where I can't play like Katarina twice. And so I'm in an interesting spot. I want to like potentially try to play Katarina twice to try to close out the game, maybe force out blocks the elusives, because that's really what's presenting the most pressure here. If I need to pivot to a Yasuo game plan, I also have the mana to do so. So I start off with an open attack. And what's really cool about this open attack is that he plays I have Naka Boros, um, looking to buff up his tentacle to make a value trade. He does draw two times, but none of them land on his tentacle, which is really, really key because if he decides to block the 5-3 with the tentacle, I can play a stun card or a recall card and trade down the tentacle, which is really, really huge, assuming he doesn't have the, the bard spell in order to add, use as a last-ditch effort to level up his tentacle. And now if he blocks an elusive or just takes damage, um, or rather, if he blocks an elusive, I'm pretty happy. But I think he ends up blocking the Tentacle, which sets me up for a very fantastic Will of Ionia. Let's see what happens. Any moment now. I think either outcome, if he blocks like both elusives, I'm pretty happy. If he blocks the tentacle and I can value trade, I'm really happy. If he takes the damage, I'm slightly less happy because uh, I'm not sure if I can kill him this turn. But perfect. I go for the Will of Ionia um, onto the 3 5 Esmus, sort of reset some stats on board. I don't particularly care about the Bard because. It's not like the bard can ever strike, even though it's a big body. I'm not killing it, and if I'm not removing it, it's not the biggest deal. Now, he does get another chime back, but that's all fine and dandy. And now, here's where I think this game gets really interesting. So, he plays Tentacle Smash that he's been holding on to for the larger part of the game, and he kills my Fae Blade Twirler. And now, here's the big sort of breaking point in this game. So, I could play Katarina. And then it stuns it, and then it goes to 9, it goes to 11, it goes to 15, and I had lethal. Oh, I missed lethal. Sick. Uh, hang on. 9, 13, 15, 16. Oh, I had lethal. Okay, sorry. I, I missed lethal here, so that's my bad. But I decided to play the Yasuo because... If my Katarina had him in lethal, now if I could count, it was actually lethal. But if my Katarina had him in lethal, I start to pivot here. Say my opponent was at 17 health and my swing wouldn't have killed him, then he could try to set up an open attack on me. And because I have two Yasos, I can use the second Yasuo as a Steel Tempest. So for the sake of this game, just imagine my opponent's at 17 health right now, and I couldn't kill him last turn. I used the Yasuo to set up this block, where now I survive, and now I can actually use my Katarina. Um, if I decide to, of course. We'll, we'll see what happens. But like, that's just uh, being able to pivot because I was being reactive, because I open attacked. 
and then deciding whether or not I wanted to end the game with Katarina or if I wanted to pick a slightly slower route and pivot with Yasuo is a very, very cool sort of mechanic that you can get because you do have leveled Katarina in your hand. And I'd end up deciding to play it and try to get aggressive with it. Um, I do have another Arachnoid Sentry, which I can just continue to stun down. It's I'm just sort of hedging the fact that he's running out of removal, and I'm forcing blocks out using the Fate Blade Twirler. I could have come in like another stun here, um, but it wouldn't really have done too much. They just play another unit, and maybe I just like push three more damage. But I can always do that in the future. I'm just trying to be as reactive as possible. Um, because I think in this spot, as long as they don't accidentally throw somehow, not I, not that I think there really is a way I could throw, um, I should always come out on top. And again, we get to start off with an open attack, making advantage of the fact that we can play Katarina twice this turn, and just uh, chugging away at his board. As long as we're forcing blocks out of the elusive, it becomes a lot harder for our opponent to kill us as well. Of course, we can always be developing here, but if they kill our Fate Blade Turtle with a tentacle smash, something like that, uh, maybe things get a little bit more complicated. But anyway, the main factor here is that we just get to be as reactive as we want which always gives us slightly more information. Uh, and, and of course, I think in some of these spots, I could have played a little bit more aggressively, like just committing to the stuns. But overall, still ended out okay. But definitely, if you see these spots where you can take these aggressive plays, then I would be inclined to do so. But in this spot, I, my opponent sounds his last card. I'm just going to play it super safe and just play out Katarina twice this turn, having after the open attack. And I have the two Blades Edges, and the game is going to end. I think what was really important about this game is just uh, transitioning between being very behind in a board state into trying to play for the win with leveling the Katarina, drawing into the wind swap Hillock, saving the uh, Fae Blade Twirlers around, and then knowing what sort of cards to play around and how to set up an advantage board state. And in that one turn where we had the rally, we were able to just completely swing the game around. We didn't draw one drop. So sad. No, no, no. Monkey is bad for us either way. Kind of suck. Sentry. Oh, that's, that's no longer our lineup. That was from Seasonal. It's Yasuo, Katarina, Scion, and Kaiza. Two drop, please. Two drop, two drop. I would really like a two drop, please. Not ideal. Definitely not ideal. Trade off Katarina. How much do I want Katarina here? What? Are you crazy? Are you actually just? Oh my lord. I'm I'm kinda I'm kinda upset. What is this? How does he hit evolve turn three, but I can't even hit evolve on turn five? Like hello? I'm actually upset. I'm so upset right now. I'm actually just so upset. Simpleton. Like what is this? <laughs> That's so crazy. So crazy, man. Death is like the wind, always by and I don't have a flaw. <laughs> oh, what is this? It's actually wild. So crazy. Sure. Current score were. It... Yeah, that. We're not dead, but we're not thriving. We are really not thriving. 
Oh, if I had you last turn. God damn, dude. You ain't velvet blood, but I ain't saying no. <sighs> I don't want to take 11. I don't know if I can afford to not take 11 though. This getting spell shield means I need to save resources. Like, getting spell shield here is so brutal. Hmm. We got a twin trade here. Okay, we can pop the spell shield then. Um, and then still leave mana for Tempest. It's a really good draw. I, I need to play around Rangers as well. I can't just like let them resolve me. And I need to play around Cataclysm. Like I need to pop this spell shield. There's no supercharge, I think we're fine. I'm learning. I am the hunter. He shouldn't pull Yasuo, it'd be a really bad mistake, I think. If he pulls Yasuo, I get to level it. That's fine. This and Katarina sucks, but it's not really something we can deal with here. I think we're fine here. I think we win from here. Like, we can stun his challenger and then we can start killing his guys. Like, he doesn't have any void A bombs on top then. And we have ways to beat Cataclysm. Oh, I should have played you instead. I should have played you and not you. This is gonna sting. If I damage this, it kills Kaiza. can't rally this turn because he already scout attack.
later. We could just kill Kaizen now. Do I care? I don't, there's no punish, right? Like, he had supercharge. Um, like, his last card's like Ryan Negation. Then I should kill it now. Yeah, I should, because it could be Ryan Negation. And then if he like kills my Yasuo afterwards, I have a second Yasuo, it doesn't really matter. I want to see Cataclysms, but oh. It has Spell Shield. It's actually kind of tricky. I don't know. Like, if it's Ryan Negation and you can top deck a second Kaiza. Okay, that's that's completely fine. That's fine. That was really good. I'm, I'm glad I got it out. I think it was better for him to let it through. I realistically think it was better to let it, let it through. Because I think it's better top decks for like a second Kaiza. Because now I actually beat this. Shouldn't attack. It's greedy. And now we beat quicksand. Alright, we have a mirror to decide my fate. Ugh. Alright, so that's gonna wrap up my Yasuo Katarina Masterclass. Uh, I hope that you guys found this guide informational and helpful in order to improve your overall Yasuo Katarina game plan. Uh, feel free to come back to this as many times as you want in order to further your understanding. But if you guys want to check out some more games, I do have some posted back on my channel a little bit earlier ago down the line, as well as the recent Master and Terror tournament that I did play in where I think I have some pretty high level gameplay. Otherwise, I, if you catch me on stream, I'm probably playing some more Yasuo Katarina, or you can just ask me to play it and I'll probably comply. So definitely a lot more resources if you guys want to see more Katarina Yasuo gameplay. But I think that this will provide a very nice starting ground and hopefully sort of change the way that you looked and approached this deck. But without further ado, this is going to be the end of it. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys did enjoy the video, please do leave a like and subscribe. It really helps me out and really shows that you guys are enjoying this kind of content that I do put a lot of effort into and really appreciate it if you guys showed some support towards it. But this has been Jason Station. This has been your Yasuo Katarina Masterclass. And I'll catch you guys in the next one. So peace out, guys, and take care.